I am Suresh Venkat. This is FaceTime with Yaron Tass, CEO of Philips Healthcare Informatic Solutions and Services. Yaron, welcome to the show. Thank you, Suresh. Right. I, I attended your very fascinating presentation, and it baffles me that in a country as, as advanced as Netherlands and Europe, systems of, of healthcare still don't work with each other. Here we are in India saying that everything works perfectly in Europe and we need to emulate the European model. And it's shocking to hear you say that not everything works perfectly. Yeah. How bad or good is it in Europe? Well, I, I think in Europe and the US, you see some of the best healthcare in the world. So you see one of the best oncology hospitals or you know, uh, cardiovascular hospitals. But then if you look at the, at the total and say, how well is the care coordinated? How much are patients empowered to take care of their own health? You, you see there's still ways to go when it comes to proper care coordination, uh, a truly, you know, people-centric healthcare, as well as optimize collaboration and workflow around, you know, chronic conditions, for instance. So, so I think we, we still have a, a ways to go in the Western world. And, you know, maybe we could even look at models where we could leapfrog in places like India or China. India has a uh, benefit of something called a demographic dividend. 60% yes. of India is under the age of 30. Yeah. Very different from the demographic profile of Europe where your aging population is increasing. Yes. But things are going to change for India. It's estimated by about 2050, we're going to have a sizable aging population. Yeah. How should we prepare for that? Well, I, I think if you look at an aging population, most people, um, most seniors, you know, have conditions that they have to deal with. Um, most people also want to stay at home rather than being in old uh, old age. Home, they do. So know. much more fun to be at home. Uh, exactly. And they tend to live healthier and happier lives at home. But then we need to help them. We need to support them to live a healthy life, even if they have conditions. And I think that will first happen in places like Europe or Japan. But it will come rapidly to other places as well. But I, I think we shouldn't wait for that. I think we should start with your young population and taking them by the hand and, and helping them live healthier lives today to avoid getting a, a chronic condition. So what you can see today, even you know, young kids that join our industry, the IT or BPO industry, you know, they, they start making money and they start leading a different life. They don't exercise enough, they drink, they eat, and they have no idea what it will mean for the health. So we shouldn't wait for, for 2050 to happen, we should start now. One of the big themes at NASCOM this year is what's called the Internet of Things, how yeah. devices will talk to each other seamlessly. What does this mean for the healthcare industry? Well, this is going to be big. This is really going to be big. Why? It's, it's not the next big dot-com boom. It's really no, it's, the next big technological so wave. This is a Philips device. And okay. what it does, it, 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 it's a, it tracks your activity. Okay. So it tracks your activity and through algorithms it can calculate how much calories you burn, how much you, you move. Um, now, if you start combining that with what you eat and how you eat, um, if you combine that with other vital signs, and this, these are sensors, and these sensors are getting more and more sophisticated. So this will tell you what's going on. That's part of the Internet of Things. Okay. But there are other parts of the Internet of Things. So, for instance, Philips has launched last year what we call connected lights. So actually you can control lamps from your smartphone. That's but these, these lamps have sensors as well. So it's not just a motion sensor, um, but it can be other sensors as well. We're looking at in our lighting business now, I'm straying a little bit from my, my area, but you know, Philips is of course the number one providing of lighting solutions, but we're looking now at lighting as a service. So we're working with some of the bigger cities on how we can use light poles as actually becoming sensory platforms. So not only do you control your light, you can take in information about the environment like CO2 or movement or you know, other things that help you optimize traffic, security, or even the look and feel of uh, entire cities. So you'll see that in the home where, where sensors will be everywhere in, in cities and it's kind of a an interesting thought what would happen if all these sensors start talking to each other and combine it with what they know about you. So it's kind of a scary thought on the one hand. On the other hand, in the healthcare space, it will give us it tremendous actually opportunities. Save lives. It will it, save it, lives. It will save precious It will minutes. save lives because I can give you a simple example. We have a product called Lifeline and seniors wear it. And when, you, when they fall, it actually senses that you fall. You, you can drop the thing and nothing will happen. But if somebody falls, it has a different set of parameters. So it will then 
bring an alert to a care center, a Philips care center. Then we read in the final signs. We have the background of the, of the person, of the patient. We can send that to the ambulance. So the ambulance knows exactly where that person is because we can triangulate where that person fell down. We can read in the final signs. We know the history, so we can bring them to the ambulance, give them the right uh, care there, but also add additional vital signs, then send it to the hospital. And we know whether we have to prioritize this and have care ready. If it's really acute uh, care, we can make sure the right person is there and the person gets treated the right way with the right care. So, and a lot of it is, you know, sensor driven because what sensors do, they measure, we monitor, and then we help. So, my next question is as a consumer, not as an interviewer. I'm worried when the Internet of Things come, comes into play. We'll have Philips devices talking to Philips devices, Apple devices talking to Apple devices, and Google devices talking only to Google devices. And for the consumer, it's going to be extraordinarily frustrating to have to make a choice yeah. between sets of devices that don't necessarily communicate. Yeah. Should it be mandatory as a protocol for all these devices to share common communication protocols and platforms, something like a TCP IP? Yeah. So it should be mandatory, but it will happen. Of it course. will happen due it to market happen. forces? Yeah, of course, because TCIP created a huge new industry. It's created you know, hundreds of millions of value. Um, so this will be the same. There will be emerging standards that we will all comply with because the proposition will be much stronger if we can have these devices talking to each other. Philips is not going to develop all these devices, but we want to embrace those devices. You know, we want to make them part of our proposition. But you see a, a standardization of protocols across... Yeah, that will happen. It's already devices. happening on the communication level. So, the for instance, there is a, a protocol called Zigbee, which we are using in our connected lamps, which is increasingly a protocol for low-energy wearable devices. And it's being across manufacturers. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a standard that is not a Philips standard or a Samsung or an Apple standard. That's an industry. So. All right, my second question comes from the world of science fiction. The more devices I have, the more, the more connected they are. What if somebody hacks into my pacemaker and yeah. kills me? What if somebody yeah. hacks into my Philips motion sensor device and says I've fallen when I've not fallen and creates a mass scare? What happens if, if, if you get connected crime across connected devices? Well, this is not science fiction. This is what exactly. something we need to take very seriously. Reality? Reality. So, so, yeah, I, and, and we believe the security and reliability of devices uh, comes first. And um, therefore, even the consumer devices that we're developing follow very strict, uh, you know, basically we take the regulatory rules from medical devices and apply that to consumer devices. Okay. And that implies security of data, security of the device, the ability to uniquely identify and authenticate the device so that you can not spoof a device. Um, making sure that your identity is clear, you authenticate it yourself as a user of the device, and then you as a consumer should be able to uh, give me permission to share that data. So you set the rules under which we can access, the access and exchange data. And that will become very important to make that very explicit because people will demand it. They don't want devices to run away with their lives or they don't want to be in a situation where somebody hacks their device and you know like the the pacemaker yeah. example i think there was one of There's the one movie, yeah. movie i recall where they so. hack into the pacemaker yeah, yeah. and give him a heart attack yeah, yeah. Uh, which movie was it? No, it was an american tv show yeah, yeah. it's a tv I've show it, yeah. called scandal i think yeah. that's the tv show yeah. Yeah. because the other big uh, question i have from an indian perspective in India, 90% of all healthcare spending is private spending, people yeah. spending out of their pockets and yeah. their bank accounts because government spending in, 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 in healthcare is woefully low in India. Yeah. So the challenges for the Indian environment in healthcare are very different from, yeah. say, the challenges yeah. in, in the US, which is very different, and, the, uh, and Europe is significantly different with socialized medicine. We are looking at technologies that can drastically bring down the cost of healthcare in India. What would you say should be the, Indian, the pillars of the, of, the, of the government's policy in India on bringing healthcare down? I think it should be enabling exactly that to happen, enabling technology to allow small villages to capture vital signs and uh, use concentrated knowledge based on data to allow these people to treat uh, people in the villages. So using technology which can be as simple as a, as a smartphone um, to a combination of a smartphone and some low-cost vital signs devices 
maybe in combination of a nurse, uh, but really extending primary care through technology. So and that can be simple things. You know, we, we do this in Indonesia, where uh, we found out that there's a very high mortality rate with pregnant women. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we started using simple smartphone-based technology to do some simple questions and tests, which allowed us to prevent a lot of that by having a direct relationship between the midwives doing the test, linking it back to a hospital in town and uh, in, in the hospital doing remote control and remote help of people in the villages. So it's a combination of easy access to, to data and the use of big data to guide and support um, the, the care process. All right. Jean, final question for you. Three things that every healthcare CEO in India should know but doesn't know. Three things that, three, three things. blind spots. <laughs> um, I think the most important one I see is that, that real connection between your personal health and taking control of your personal health and the link with professional health. Okay. Because right now that's fragmented. You know, you come in when it's acute, when you, when you your heart hurts or we you don't do preventive pain. maintenance yeah. we don't do preventive maintenance so uh, so i think that's a big one and that's under underutilized and okay. to me it's the consumerization of, of healthcare so so that's one continuous real time monitoring of health exactly okay um, i think the second one is think through completely new business models because for instance you you have some real big companies here in india that have employees so can you make a relationship between large hospital groups, an insurance company and a big company and, and see can we collectively improve the health of our mm -hmm. employees and their families? Mm -hmm. You know, if you have 200,000 employees, you're typically looking at, you know, maybe even up to half a million people. And if you give them more control and the tools were great in technology in India, so let's leverage that and start looking at new models to provide But you need healthcare. fundamentally new business models to exactly. create. Exactly. Right. And Number I think we're, we're stuck in our, our old business models. Right. Now the third one, <laughs> now you got me because... Uh, Go for a jog uh, every day, don't smoke and don't drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all know that. Uh, but we also know that, for instance, in hospital, we do hospital to home in the US where we okay. guide people at home. And they're giving us feedback saying, hey, we know you monitor us. And that's already a motivation to be more conscious about making that. Yeah. You know, if you tell me to take my pills on time, you know, just adhering to the treatment plan will make a huge leap. So how can we use this and, and these, you know, I would say almost, you know, more psychology type The so-called observer effect. Exactly. If you observe somebody so attentive. I would say that's a huge opportunity there that doesn't cost a lot. All right. Jean Tas, thank you for talking to us. It was a pleasure.